Welcome to the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. Last October, Project Censored presented a two-day gathering of media activists and scholars. We called it Media Freedom Summit 2.0, Critical Media Literacy for Social Justice. On this week's program, we'll hear excerpts of some of the discussants at that event. The speakers of these excerpts address issues ranging from Palestine to leadership in the African-American community, as well as issues surrounding media and censorship in general. Please you stay with us. Welcome back to the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. On this week's program, we're hearing excerpts of some of the discussions that took place at our Media Freedom Summit at the College of Marin in late October. The summit attracted journalists, faculty, and students, including many of the contributors to our latest book, Censored 2019, Fighting the Fake News Invasion. You can learn more about the event and, of course, our recent book at projectcensored.org. First, let's hear three of the speakers who took part in the keynote panel, the main event of the weekend. And let's begin with independent journalist Abby Martin. So media is not only under attack, but the notion of truth is under attack as well, especially from this administration, right? I mean, we have grassroots anti-establishment voices being purged online. We already know that. But even the unfavorable corporate media is actually under attack uh, by this administration, which is very disturbing. These pipe bombs that were sent to CNN, these leading Democrats, Trump's response was pretty telling. He blamed the media itself for inciting the violence. That is pretty disturbing when that's the rhetoric coming out from the government itself. So he celebrates violence against political opponents. He celebrates violence against these media institutions, right? And says that it's their fault. Typical gaslighting, typical deflection. And honestly, even his tweet saying the bombs, the alleged bombs that were sent. So this is very interesting and a new thing that we're seeing where Trump has actually weaponized conspiracy theories. He's weaponized them and and enveloped them actually into the right-wing sphere on his behalf. Suddenly, conspiracies serve him when conspiracies used to challenge the actual federal government and the deep state apparatus. So that's a very interesting trend that we're seeing. And also, we're seeing actually mainstream, um, the mainstreaming of these conspiracies. So we're seeing GOP figures, leaders, Ann Coulter, not that she's really a GOP leader, she's more of a con artist, just like Trump. But I mean, everyone from Rush Limbaugh to Frank Gaffney are saying that these were false flag attacks, right? To frame Trump supporters. So we're living in quite a bizarre world and a quite a bizarre reality right now, um, where it's effectively become broken and which makes Conferences like this, media literacy, so crucial because we're wading through these mass hallucinations on both sides of the political aisle. We have the fake news hysteria versus the Russian propaganda. And these are the factions that are warring within the establishment. And we see them play out in the public sphere like they have been doing. You know, trust in media was already at an all-time low during the 2016 election. Trump simply exploited that distrust, right? He made it seem like the media is this liberal elite institution, and he's fighting that. He's fighting the liberal media. Um, And the media lies. They're all about fake news. Well, actually, that's not true. The establishment media simply has factions, just like the political establishment, just like the deep state. When you look at the factions of the media establishment, you have Fox News, Breitbart, Drudge. They worship the president, actually in a scary way. Um, They absolutely worship the ground he walks on. So that's not fake news. That's real news to him because it serves him. It entrenches his own power. So, you know, there's these cartoonish depictions about what the media is and the constructs that I'm talking about right now. And we really have to step outside of that and apply some critical thinking about it. So he's hijacked conspiracy culture. He's hijacked that term fake news. Um, And he's exploited people's distrust in corporate media and used that to his advantage while peddling fake news constantly. Very, very interesting. So now distrust in corporate media has become partisan, which is fascinating. I think the elections have really, truly broken everyone's brains in quite a profound way, uh, and that's going back to these mass hallucinations, the Russian propaganda versus fake news, where the Democratic establishment cannot account for their abysmal institutional failures, that they have to deflect every single thing on Russia, on these sinister Kremlin elements that are really engineering all the the narratives that 
fill the vacuum. Frankly, if you look at Ru- Russia today, the network that I worked at, that simply fills the vacuum of what the corporate media is failing to do. So when you look at, let's say, the end-all, be-all report, that DNI report on so-called Russian collusion, you see that, in fact, it was just a crude analysis about RT programming, namely my show, which had ended two years prior to the election, as part of somehow some Kremlin plot to elect Donald Trump. What did my show talk about? It talked about inequality, police brutality, third-party candidates. So... Really, when you kind of understand what they're calling Kremlin propaganda, it's what really counters that narrative, that mainstream narrative in the bipartisan foreign policy consensus. Anything outside of that sphere is fake news, is Russian propaganda, and is being sinisterly engineered by Vladimir Putin. You know, the neoliberal blob acts like it hates Trump. I think we all kind of understand why at this point. I mean, he really ripped the mask of empire right off. He makes empire way less palatable to sell around the world. But they don't hate him for the right reasons, right? They don't hate Trump for carpet bombing civilians. They don't hate him for endorsing genocide in Yemen. They don't hate him for endorsing apartheid in Israel, where journalists are getting assassinated on a weekly basis on camera. No, they don't hate him for those for those reasons, do they? No. In fact, even though they call him a potential Hitler who should have no power at all, they're perfectly comfortable granting him a $700 billion military budget and warrantless wire tapping surveillance powers. In fact, they're pushing him from the right, actually, on a lot of these issues. Militarism, war, whether it be calling him weak for pulling out of a Cold War missile treaty that sets us on a path to nuclear war, he's weak. That's giving Vladimir Putin a present. He gave him a gift. Can you believe this? And you have leading Democrats actually pushing Trump from the right, preemptively blocking the removal of troops from South Korea, just in case. Just in case. I mean, this is some really, really warped things going on. And the corporate media, of course, is weaponized not only to protect the corporations that subsidize these networks, but it's also weaponized on behalf of empire to sell empire and to maintain U.S. hegemony around the world. It cartoonishly tells us who's our friend and who's our foe. It just lays it out for you, right? Iran, North Korea, Venezuela. Who's our friend? Saudi Arabia and Israel. Two of the most egregious human rights offenders in the world today. That is quite astounding. And, you know, when this brutal dismemberment, and it is an absolutely horrific story, this brutal dismemberment of this journalist in the Saudi consulate, why was that all of a sudden noticed by the corporate media when they had ignored, you know, an ongoing genocide in Yemen where twice as many people that died in the Holocaust, actually up to three times, could die from starvation by the end of this year? Why was that not newsworthy? Could it be because this was one of their own? This was an elite journalist. You know, he was a Washington Post journalist. He was an elite figure in those circles. And so I think that really struck fear in their hearts. And all of a sudden, so what are they calling for? Well, they're not calling for uh, anything good, you know, actual democracy in Saudi Arabia. No, they're calling for just another puppet, one who will fit more in line, who won't make as many waves. And you actually saw Trump uh, had a fascinating response to this. He said, too bad the cover-up was botched or something to that effect. He seemed just annoyed that it wasn't covered up efficiently enough. So now he has to maybe do something about it. But don't worry, he's not going to do much because he actually said brazenly, again, removing the mask of empire, Trump actually said, no, we can't sanction Saudi Arabia. We can't lose the billions of dollars in weapons sales to Saudi Arabia. That's truly fascinating that we are at that level where We have this belligerent, arrogant CEO of the empire who can just brazenly talk about reality, I guess. And, you know, as much as we hear about Russia, 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 and the Russia propaganda and um, the Putin channel, it's fascinating when you see actually the, the entrenched influence of Israel and Saudi Arabia in the D.C. establishment through the efforts of PR. Tens of millions of dollars funneled into these think tanks, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, all of these Gulf states as well as Israel. I mean, every time you peel back a layer of the Russia collusion story, you get actually a layer of Israeli collusion with the government. But of course, you will not hear this on the establishment press, right? So the establishment press serves the interests of the U.S. empire, protects the interests of the ruling class, not the people living under the boot of empire, not the people subjugated by global capitalism. Of course not. 
And they'll bemoan outlets like Russia Today for propaganda, but they act as an extension of the state. What is the difference between U.S. corporate media and what Russia Today is? There is no difference. It's actually much more scary because it's obfuscated in, you know, hundreds of different entities and they couch their opinions and they pretend like they're so-called objective journalists, but they couch those opinions in these think tanks that are stacked with CIA contractors and cops and defense contractors. You know, they do not hear, we do not hear on the corporate media about half the country living paycheck to paycheck about people not having a thousand dollars in savings. That's the reality that we need to reflect. That's why institutions like Project Censored are so crucial to spread this message to the public. That's the foundation of democracy, right? So I do a show called The Empire Files, which uses the U.S. empire as a starting point, as a frame of reference to analyze all domestic issues and all international is- issues through this lens, because it truly is crucial to understand how the world has been shaped by colonizers, and retell the narratives of the marginalized and oppressed that have been affected by the colonization of the planet and, and the U.S. empire. But of course, nothing that I talk about on the show is allowed on corporate media, which is why we go to places like Telesaur, like Russia Today, to tell these stories. Because the parameters of our debate are extremely limited, and they perpetuate these hierarchies of oppression, of course. So that's where we're at. We're at, we're here now where we've been able to build up our voices on social media and alternative media. And we've challenged these institutions. We've challenged these entrenched corporate media entities. And that's why we're seeing this wave of censorship now online. They become privy to it. We've been able to challenge the power of CNN. We've been able to challenge the audience of CNN with some of these institutions that we've created in a grassroots level. And that scares the hell out of them. So now we're seeing them working in concert with, with tech agencies, you know, working in concert with the U.S. government. And they're not private corporations. No, they're a public commons that we bought into to reflect the egalitarian nature of the Internet. And now they're not just private corporations. And no, they're not just doing this on their own. They are literally working with the U.S. government to shut down alternative voices online. But that is why Project Censored is so crucial. You know, it seems terrifying, this wave of censorship. It seems daunting. We're totally uh, disempowered by this kind of force that seems totally out of our control. But it should be a sign of how well we're doing to challenge these paradigms and these institutions, the old guard. We're scaring the hell out of them. That's why they're so desperately shutting us down. Project Censored is such an incredible organization. I've been a part of this organization for about 10 years. It inspired me to get involved in media activism. I've never met a better family to encourage the growth of media and to help me become who I am today. And it provides such important tools and resources for people to become media literate. And it staunchly lobbies for the commons, right, to provide information for the commons to to be better, (laughs) I guess. So everyone here is involved in something truly, truly historic, something very, very important and something frankly revolutionary because everyone here involved in media is doing some of the most important work of our era and of this time because it is a very critical time for our planet, our species, our society. And it seems again daunting that so many things are being pushed backward, but right now, Us and so many like us across the country and across the world are combining forces to push us forward, to push for progress, despite what's going on. And so thank you, because you guys are crucial. You guys are instrumental in this. We all are. We all need to build each other up. We need to build up the truth, become media literate. And I'm really proud to be a part of this community and a part of this event. Thanks. Project Censored Show, and I'm your host, Mickey Huff. On this week's program, we're listening to some of the material from our Media Freedom Summit 2.0 at the College of Marin in late October. Special thanks to Dennis Murphy for the audio for this. We just heard independent journalist Abby Martin, one of the speakers for our keynote panel of all women. Next, let's hear two more of these keynote panelists. First, we'll hear from Nora Barros Friedman, and then we'll hear from Eleanor Goldfield.
I work for a publication called the Electronic Intifada. How many of you have heard of yeah? Yes. Oh my God, that's amazing. Um, I've given many, many talks about the work that I do, and usually it's only like three or four people and my mom. Um, if she's <laughs> um, so, thank you. And if you haven't seen the Electronic Intifada, go to electronicintifada.net. We are the premier. English language news information analysis and cultural feature resource for everything Palestine, Palestinian human rights related. And also a beat that I cover is the activism in relation to Palestine liberation struggles around the world. Mainly my, my beat, because I live here, is U.S. activism and how students are organizing, how students are resisting, how communities, city councils are pushing back against contracts with their local municipal police departments and and Israeli counterterrorism trainings. These trainings are happening all over the states. Dozens and dozens of U.S. police forces are going to Israel to be trained by Israeli counterterrorism units and then take that militarization training back to militarize our local communities here. A lot of people doing incredible work. Of course, we also cover... The Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement, uh, which is a global grassroots struggle campaign for uh, Palestine liberation. And it is it is such a threat to Israel that Israel has actually developed its own branch in government related to combating BDS. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. They're throwing tens of millions, probably hundreds of millions of dollars around the world to try and combat this grassroots campaign for, for uh, justice for Palestinians. They have a, a ministry, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which is involving itself in black ops to spy on, intimidate, harass, and threaten BDS activists around the world, including students. So there's a lot going on in our little corner of news writing and publishing, but it is great. And working for a place like the Electronic Intifada has many benefits, many of which are you know related to preserving and amplifying independent journalism and supporting independent journalists, citizen journalists all over Palestine, citizen journalists in Europe, in Europe, in the States, Latin America, all over Asia, all over Africa, people who are doing incredible work and are not able to break through places like the New York Times or CNN to get their stories told. And of course, we see journalists, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, fresh out of J school or never in J school to begin with, journalists going to, to try and report on stories like Palestine and they pitch stories to their editors and, you know, 99% of the time they come back with, oh, hell no, we're not touching that. Or here's the line you need to, you need to write in order to be published by your publication. When you look at Palestine, it is one of the most deliberately misinformed stories right now for the last 70 years, but uh, especially right now where you have journalists now, because if they want to get published and they're covering something on Palestine, they know how to self-censor at mm -hmm. this point in order to get past the editorial board and headline writers and their desk editors. So we see Palestine consistently, constantly, epidemically framed as this two sides conflict. We see what's happening at the, the boundary between Gaza and Israel right now. It's not a border mm -hmm. because Gaza is an occupied um, territory. It is a boundary fence, a highly militarized boundary fence. And for the last 31 weeks in a row, every Friday for the last 31 weeks, people in Gaza have been coming by the tens of thousands, sometimes to the boundary fence, unarmed, obviously, except with rocks and sometimes kites and large flags, demanding that they be able to return to the lands, which many of whom can see over the boundary fence that they were exiled from 70 years ago, which is a natural human right enshrined in the UN Resolution 194, which was passed in 1949, ratified every year since, but has never been implemented because it's been vetoed by the U.S. They're demanding the right of return. They are demanding that Israel stop the 11-year siege that it has imposed on the Gaza Strip for the crime of democratic elections in 2006. They are demanding that the occupation be lifted, that the borders be opened so that they can get goods and services and that people can travel for medical treatment because they can't get it in Gaza. There is no chemotherapy in Gaza. 
There's hard, hardly any antibiotics in Gaza. A friend of mine is a medic. He's a Palestinian-Canadian doctor. And during one of these Friday protests, he was in Gaza training other paramedics how to do triage uh, field surgery, basically. And he was picked off by a sniper. He survived, but he was shot through both legs. And he, knowing how to treat his own wounds, was able to, they don't have, they ran out of tourniquets many, 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 many months before. And so part of Tarek's um, work was not only training the paramedics, but also making these like makeshift tourniquets. So he grabbed, I think, someone's shirt and tied it around his leg. And they took him to a local clinic that was obviously overflowing with people. Tens of thousands of people have been injured, mostly in their lower limbs by Israeli snipers. And I talked to him on the phone that day. He was doing all right, but he developed sepsis, which is, I know he was on Democracy Now! You can kind of go back and read his story, but what Democracy Now! and and other outlets that kind of came and left and didn't do follow-up on that story failed to mention was that about a week later, he developed sepsis because there is no antibiotics and hardly any analgesic medication. He said he he had like one Tylenol and one Advil that he brought with him from home. And that was about it. He's okay because he's a Canadian citizen. He was able to leave Gaza, which most people in Gaza cannot do, and was able to get better treatment at home in Toronto. So he's okay. But those are the kinds of stories that are are left out even in like the progressive or left-wing media because it is such an ongoing, you know, today five people were killed and it's nowhere in the headlines, absolutely nowhere. We covered it on EI because we do that every Friday because we, for the last 31 weeks and the decade and a half, God, we've been around almost 20 years. So for two decades, we cover the stories that aren't featured in most progressive media, let alone the corporate mainstream. So I think being able to cover those stories is only possible because we are 100% independent. We don't take ads. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we throw down five or ten bucks on Facebook to get our boost. But Facebook has been, and I'm sure they've done it for Empire Files too, they've been obscuring independent media outlets on on its site under the guise of like, well, some of it's fake news. We don't know which ones are, which one aren't. So we're just going to like cover everything that's not like the main corporate news and Facebook news with a blanket of obscurity. So we've seen our Facebook posts visibility drop, you know, tenfold in one month. But that's all to say, that's fine. We keep going. We keep doing our thing. The readers still support us. Um, We're able to raise enough funds every year through reader donations to pay salaries and pay a pretty decent, comparable reporting fee for our reporters in Gaza, in the West Bank, uh, elsewhere around the world. And it's great because we control the editorial content. We don't have to check in with a corporate sponsor about what we can say about Raytheon's weapons and what we can't. And I think we're only getting better and better. I think that also allows us to be as principled, as radical, and as unwavering as hell. And it's a privilege to be on that editorial board. And as a a day-to-day reporter and editor, I am very happy and very lucky. Thank you. My name is Eleanor Goldfield, and uh, I just want to start by saying that I'm absolutely honored to be here with all of you and with these amazing journalists. So I'm a creative activist and a journalist, and as a reporter asked me on J20, the inauguration day, when I was standing there in a red paint splattered American flag, how can you be both? And I said, it's necessary to be both. Basically, if you're neutral and silent in times of oppression, you possibly choose the role of the oppressor. And I think that's vital, particularly now, when we see what Abby was talking about, these interesting and very scary times. It's very important to not just be doing media that, like we're talking about here, but also to be that activist. And so what I do is mostly domestic issues, Predominantly, recently, at least, pipeline fights, police brutality, the prison industrial complex, indigenous rights, women's rights, and then also the connectivity of these issues, because I've been an activist for more than 15 years, and one of the things that me off more than anything else is that everyone sits in a silo, 
and everyone kind of sits there and doesn't reach out to their friends and works in solidarity. They're like, oh, well, I'd love to help you, but I'm only women's rights. Or I'd love to help you, but I'm only doing this thing. I'm only doing fracking. The problem is, is that that's not how politics works, right? Politics is everything that we do every day. And it has to do with the fact that these dirty energy projects are predominantly going through the most marginalized communities. So that means black and brown and indigenous communities. So you can't take away the systemic racism of this system from the fact that these dirty energy projects are being built continuously. And of course, that works for foreign issues as well. Recently, when I was at Camp White Pine, which is the camp that was fighting against the Mariner East 2 pipeline in Pennsylvania, they were doing tree sits and they dropped a banner one day that said basically solidarity with Palestine because we recognize that these issues are connected. And they also dropped a banner that said solidarity with Rojava. We recognize that the issues of empire are happening on foreign soil, but they are very much happening on our own soil as well. Because the same empire that has a thousand military bases across the world are occupying neighborhoods here in the United States. And if you go into many black and brown and indigenous communities here, they will tell you that there's an occupying force, and that's the police. The heavily militarized police, I'd also like to point out. The other side of what I do, and one of the reasons that I started my show which is called Act Out, which airs online and is syndicated on Free Speech TV, was to talk solutions, because that's another thing that I think can get really heavy, right? We talk about these... Alternative media does such an amazing job of showcasing the realities that corporate media don't want to talk about. But at the same time, people will come up to me and they're like, oh, wow, it's so depressing. I'm now an alcoholic. And I get that. It's <laughs> it's rough. <laughs> and that's why I also think that it's really important to talk solutions, right? And that's why it's also important to talk to activists and to those community members because no one knows what they need more than the community members themselves, right? You're not going to ask someone sitting here what Palestine needs because the people who know that are the Palestinians, same thing goes for indigenous folks battling the tail end of the Dakota Access Pipeline in Louisiana. They know what they need. And so part of what I do is to go down into those communities, first and foremost as an activist. I go there to try and help. Of course, I bring my camera, but the first job is, okay, what do you need me to do? Oh, you need, uh, you need help making food? Great. I'm not great at child care, I'll admit that. But if, you, if you're desperate, <laughs> I will babysit. That's how I like to go into these situations because I think the other problem is is that people have gotten really distrustful of, of media. Because, for instance, the, the what's going on right now in Louisiana at Loe La Vie Camp that's basically battling the tail end of the Dakota Access Pipeline is that they've been so misrepresented in corporatized media. Oh, there are these indigenous militants that are throwing rocks at cops or whatever, which, first of all, I wish that were true. Um, but second of all, it's not. It's not at all. They have been entirely peaceful, and the cops have... I mean, when I was there in the swamps, they just tased someone who was up in a tree, and the person fell from the tree. That's incredibly dangerous. So the corporate media does not obviously talk about that. If they have talked about it, it's been very sort of flippant. And to say that, oh, we need this because jobs. But unfortunately for them, Energy Transfer Partners has admitted that the final project of the Bayou Bridge Pipeline will result in 12 jobs. They are destroying the lives of thousands of people, predominantly black and indigenous people, for 12 jobs, of which several will not even be in state. So the idea that this will result in jobs is ludicrous. And even if that were true, wouldn't you prefer a job that's sustainable and that doesn't further poison one of the most poisoned states in the country? So part of the, part of the important work that I think needs to be done is talking solutions. And part of that is having activists on our shows and also hearing their stories because, again, they're the ones who know what needs to be done and they'll be able to tell you how to help, how to work in solidarity with them and to get that message out. And another part of that for me is the importance of art and creativity. I'm a creative activist that predominantly looks like music and spoken word for me, but all kinds of mediums. And I think that not only is it an important outlet so that I'm not an alcoholic, but it's also a very powerful tool for thinking creatively. 
And uh, Ifat, who was here uh, earlier, she did an amazing panel on Kashmir and the situation there, but she mentioned something that I thought was very interesting, that the Indian military closed down cinemas, almost one of the first things that they did, not only because of the films, but also because that's where people would meet, that's where people would congregate, and it's dangerous when people get together and meet and talk, right? So I think that that's very telling. And if you look at our school system, some of the first programs that they cut are music and art because it's very hard to keep people in line if they have a creative mind because they'll automatically want to think outside the box. They'll want to question things. Why? Why capitalism? Why imperialism? Why colonialism? These questions will be pushed into their minds. But if you only teach them what to think and you try to push down any sort of creativity, then they're less likely to dissent, and they're more likely to be good proles. So I think the, the factor of art and creativity is something that's, that's really, really important, creative thinking outside the box. And finally, before I just want to say, with regards to the crackdown on, on media, I was telling somebody earlier that I just watched my Facebook numbers slowly drain like a bathtub, and yet Facebook tells me, oh, you got so and so many likes this week. So censorship on corporatized social media is very real as well, and I definitely recommend people look into decentralized social media outlets, but another great tool that you should all do is sign up for newsletters, because getting information directly via email from the journalists and the outlets that you trust is the best way to ensure that you'll keep getting it. So just a little tip there. You know, it's tough because like we're all talking about, I mean, the U.S. has tentacles basically everywhere in the entire planet. We have special ops in 70 percent of the world's nations, troops on the ground in essentially every country that the U.S. is, uh, you know, has a base um, and not, you know, special ops all over Africa, AFRICOM expanding. So it, it is the big question, right? What what will the U.S. empire do in the death throes, because we are at a crisis, right? The empire is at a crisis. Trump represents that kind of breaking point where we see these factions within the establishment bleeding out, like I said, in the public arena. So I think that, yeah, the empire is waning in a sense. We see China picking up, you know, it, with the loans in Africa and people are, are looking to those institutions more than they are the IMF, the World Bank. So, yeah, it's a, it's a serious question. What is the U.S. military going to do? Because we've never seen an empire that has global reach and that has actual military penetration. And it's going to be, it could be bloody, violent, and very ugly. But it also could be a peaceful transition, and that depends on, you know, the empowerment and, and the organizational structures on the ground. And that's a really tough one because, again, it's global but as the U.S. empire's power wanes, I think that, you know, it depends on what other world institutions and what world players are going to do to let the U.S. retreat peacefully and or not. I mean, it depends on, you know, how much is the U.S. going to react when it loses that power around the world and are, are they going to relinquish it peacefully? So it, it's, a, it's a question that I ask often, <laughs> you know, what's coming and how bad is it going to get? when the U.S. empire really does fall, quote-unquote, because we have not seen this before. I'll just add to that while we're, I guess, yeah, please. figuring that out. There are crises everywhere. No, I, I think to, to answer your question with a really difficult answer is a line from, from the Vietnam era, but I use it in my spoken word, is what if they held a war and nobody came? Mm. And so I think that we are the children of empire, right? We Americans. And I think it falls on us to, to do something. And that's obviously why we do what we do. But also, if you're interested in alternative media, why are you interested? You're interested because you want things to change. And I think that everything from the military forces, you know, there are a lot of veterans organizations that deal with peace, like Iraq Veterans Against War or uh, Veterans for Peace, but also us as Americans, we children of empire. And that's our job. It's our job to dismantle this empire. I wanted to add something really quickly. First, we need to understand that we are an empire because when I talk about this issue, people literally think I'm talking about Star Wars. No joke. So I think it's, you know, first and foremost, obviously information and taking it more underground because as censorship increases, we have to go back to the structures that we used to be able to penetrate, right? And, and that's peer to peer, person to person. 
we didn't used to have the internet. What the hell did we do then? Right? So we need to go back to, to how it used to be to get these organizational structures going to challenge these institutions. So definitely information first and foremost for people to understand the structures that we're even talking about here. This is the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. On this week's program, we're listening to some of the material from Project Censored's Media Freedom Summit 2.0. It was our social justice conference that focused on critical media literacy education. Coming up next, we're going to hear some of the discussion from a panel that was on junk food news and news abuse propaganda. The first speaker we'll hear is Professor John Collins. He teaches at St. Lawrence University in Global Studies and also runs the Weave News. He'll begin by explaining the concept of news abuse developed by Peter Phillips at Project Censored almost 20 years ago. Then later in the segment, we'll hear from panelists Nicole Egbert and Steve Barraza. My name is John Collins, and I teach in the Global Studies Department at St. Lawrence University. I've actually spent most of my career researching and writing about the Palestinian liberation struggle, which is sort of a perpetual news abuse topic in many ways. It's one of the great blind spots of the establishment news media in the United States. And in the last 10 years or so, I've gotten a lot more interested in making media and working with this organization, Weave News, that that I helped to create and that I'm still one of the directors for. So three of my Weave News colleagues, two of whom are here today, and then also Jana Morgan had the honor of contributing to the book this year in the form of this news abuse chapter. And I'm just going to say a few things about our approach, basically, kind of how we went about thinking about this topic of news abuse. And then I'm going to turn it over to Steve and Nicole, and they're going to talk in more detail about the pieces that the chapter that they wrote. So we describe news abuse in our chapter as the magic trick of establishment media. And so what do we mean by that? The, the metaphor of, of a magician's trick is one that I often use in my classes when I'm talking about the concept of ideology. And the basic idea is that magicians do their work through distraction, right? They, in order to make sure that we don't notice the important stuff, they draw our eyes somewhere else, right? So the magician is always saying, like, look at this shiny thing or whatever that I'm doing up here. And meanwhile, like, something really important is happening down here with the other hand. And, uh, and then when the, when the sort of thing is revealed, you have no idea how it happened because you weren't watching the stuff that actually made it happen. So it's a bit like 9-11, right, where... Where, you know, we're sort of living in this two dimensional world. Suddenly there's a hole in our world and we're like, where did that come from? It came from some other dimension, which was history, right? That, uh, there's this historical background that our attention had been diverted away from for a long time. So this idea of the magician's trick, I think, is a useful way to think about commercial media coverage as a whole. But, um, and then the whole, you know, the junk food news, I think, is like a attempting distraction from the stories that we need to know about and news abuse in a similar way. Even when important stories are covered, even when they're being covered, we're still being tricked by the magician. So certain elements of the story are systematically foregrounded. Perhaps those elements that power the treadmill of the two-party system or uh, the false binaries of public discourse. Perhaps those elements that otherwise fit the ideological needs of the power elite. Those are the ones that are going to be foregrounded in the coverage of that story. And as we fixate on those elements, there's other elements of the story that remain in the shadows. Perhaps those elements that might complicate the dominant frames. Or those elements that would call our attention to deeper structures. Structures of things like U.S. imperialism or corporate power or white supremacy. So with this in mind, our team took a sustained look at establishment news coverage from 2017. We used the category of establishment media because we sort of wanted to foreground the ways in which uh, legacy media outlets like the New York Times and the, and the Washington Post and others really serve the interests of the establishment and serve to kind of fix the terms of, of public debate. And we wanted to figure out, okay, where is news abuse happening? Uh, so two of the stories that we highlighted involved what critical scholars of semiotics call ex-nomination, which basically means the refusal to name things, the refusal to name 
the structures and the interests that might actually hold the key to understanding the story that's being covered. And if those things are not being named, how can we understand the story? So in one case, and this is the piece that Jana wrote about, coverage of the post-2016 rollbacks in important types of government regulation, like regulation of the financial sector, for example, or regulation in the oil, gas, and mining sector, things like this. We discovered a troubling failure to name what should be a rather obvious and central part of the story, which is the systematic efforts of big corporations to capture the regulatory process itself for the purpose of neutering that process. So at terms like corporate capture, regulatory capture, even the term corporate power, which is a pretty obvious term to anybody who's paying attention to these issues, those terms were either absent from the coverage entirely or else present only in ways that were very tangential to the fundamental structural processes that people need to know about. And then in another case, and this is what I looked at, we found that coverage of Palestine was marked by the endless repetition of certain phrases that critical scholars, activists, and observers have been debunking for years. Not just years, decades, right? The two-state solution, the peace process, and the infamous language of both sides, right? Violence on both sides. And so with the media magician sort of fixing our attention on these frames and on periodic episodes of spectacular violence. Oh, there was an upsurge in violence, you know, some rockets were fired or, you know, some clashes happened along the so-called border between Israel and Gaza or something like that. So our attention is focused there, but the key reality is on the ground. Colonization of land. The everyday violence visited upon Palestinians. Home demolitions. The existence of a single state not a two-state solution, the actual existence now of a single apartheid state. Those things remain out of view. And when I say out of view, I'm not exaggerating. I looked at over 3,000 establishment news articles for this study, and the terms colonial, colonize, and colonization only appeared a total of 15 times in over 3,000 articles with reference to Israeli policies and actions. And slightly more than half of those 15 references were in op-eds or interviews. And not a single expert on the topic of settler colonization was ever quoted in over 3,000 news articles about Israel-Palestine. So that's how ex-nomination works. Right? Don't name the thing that's actually going on. Call our attention to other things. So I want to give a shout out to our colleague, Janet Morgan, who wasn't able to be here for the conference. She was one of the students in the seminar that created Weave News back in 2007, and she co-authored the chapter with us. She does great work in Washington on transparency, promoting transparency in the oil, gas, and mining sector. My two other colleagues, Steve Peraza and Nicole Eigbert, are here on the panel, and I'm going to turn things over to them for more on our analysis of news abuse in 2017. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole, and I'm a former global studies student of John, graduated from St. Lawrence in 2014. So I was really excited to be part of this critical media analysis and really contribute to this year's Project Censored. And when we were discussing in our group what issues of news abuse we wanted to take up, you know, the, the first thing that jumped into my mind was the ceaseless coverage of Trump voters. And just for context, in our analysis, we covered, for the sake of having a, you know, a clear framework, we covered uh, seven different establishment media sites. We analyzed the New York Times, Washington Post, Boston Globe, Wall Street Journal, NPR, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. So just keep that in mind when we're discussing the coverage that we were looking at. But I'm wondering, for just folks in the room, when you've come across coverage about Trump voters, what sort of descriptors have you associated with Trump voters? You can just shout them out. Blue collar, working class, baskets under four wheels. White. White, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was my jumping up point. I was like, there's definitely this clear narrative of who the Trump voter is. And so the first thing I looked at, I did a survey of just how many times the phrase Trump voters appeared in these media outlets. And 
In 2017, Trump voters appeared in the headlines of 2,040 stories. And of these stories, 49% of them included these descriptors. Poor, um, 340 stories had that. And working class, 241 stories. White working class, populist, Rust Belt, Heartland. And in thinking about the motivations of Trump supporters, you know, 15% of these stories did include the term racism, nationalism, or nativism. So this is definitely the understanding that we've all come out with. But this forced narrative is really hiding a bigger picture. So basically, in, in my essay of the chapter, I'm arguing that establishment media was really reinforcing a simplified class conflict. Because by and large, the racialized component, especially in 2017, immediately following the election, was left out of the conversation, right? You know, you were constantly hearing that Trump voters were motivated by their economic anxiety. It wasn't until I think more recently, Pew Research or someone came out with, oh yeah, racism and white supremacy also was a motivator. So that was one major issue. And I just felt like this coverage was really in, in reinforcing a longstanding classist mythology that exists in our country by really blaming explicitly the white working class for Trump's claim to power. And I'm not saying they're not responsible, but the Washington Post was basically the only outlet of these seven in 2017 to point out the fact that the majority of Trump supporters were actually wealthy Republicans living in the suburbs and the cities. But did we ever really hear those stories or have those interviews? Ultimately, all this coverage was really reinforcing these classist narratives and shielding the hegemonic elite. Because we know at the end of the day, it's this, these wealthy elite who control our institutions, many of which are probably at the helms of these very media outlets. And in a similar vein, I'm arguing that because of this hyper obsession with the mythology and motivation of Trump supporters, the establishment media was also further harming the already marginalized communities that knew from the beginning that electing Trump was bad news. But where are those think pieces? Why aren't we getting in-depth interviews? Why isn't there just any balanced coverage? So anybody left of center, you just never had that. So I, I just see a lot of harm happening here. And there just seemed to be very few attempts to humanize these resistors. So, for instance, we did end up having social movements become more mainstream through things like the Women's March, the March for Science, and so on. But I think, again, when the establishment media tend to cover that, it was just like this monolithic one-off happening, you know, isn't this great? We have, you know, 50,000 people storming Washington, D.C., but at the end of the day, the larger context and the historical acknowledgement that LGBTQ, people of color, disabled people have been fighting this harm for decades now, but suddenly the resistance has come to save us. So I think ultimately the coverage of Trump's entire presidency can also be considered news abuse because it really served as a distraction from the real damage of his policies and his destabilization of the middle class, the war in Yemen, everything that's happening to immigrants and DACA recipients in our country. He's making these nationalist narratives more mainstream. And even though our coverage in SE really focuses on 2017, I've been keeping an eye and ear out. And the New York Times has really driven me insane with this in this regard because they're constantly sending out interview requests. Are you a Trump voter? And feeling like your community doesn't like you and things like that and asking for those perspectives, which, you know, I guess is maybe fine in a way. Maybe these people are feeling underheard, but what I'm just arguing at the end of the day is balancing the coverage. You know, 2017, we had Charlottesville, right? And I think that drew a lot of attention to the Antifa movement. And so, again, rather than giving people like Alex Jones, the mic on NPR, like, why weren't you reaching out to more of these left-wing activists rather than speculating from your seat in the newsroom about what they're doing, get them on the mic so they could share their story and share their perspectives. In my essay, you'll see some quotes from different interviews. Again, Trump voters were granted, but activists and people on the left were not.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Peraza. I'm also a graduate of St. Lawrence University. I graduated in 2006. I'm currently an assistant professor of history at Buffalo State College, where I teach American history, specialize in African American history, and so I jumped at the opportunity to write about Colin Kaepernick. My piece is very much qualitative and very much part of a broader theory that I'm developing, so I'm going to pitch it to you now. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a new nadir in race relations. The first nadir is 1880 to 1920. Really, the capstone of that was lynching, so extrajudicial killings. I'm making the case that today we have a very similar problem, a very similar low point. I think it manifests in just the general way we cannot talk about race without it devolving into some kind of really tense argument or a break in communication altogether. But I've been tracing three particular pillars in this. The first is extrajudicial killing. So maybe we're not seeing lynchings, but we are seeing African-Americans killed without any recourse to justice or the law. It's happening outside the courts. It's happening, you know, in the hands of vigilantes as well as police. Right. So from Trayvon Martin, Eric Gardner, Sandra Bland, we see a number of these killings. The second pillar here is colorblind laws. We've seen this at the end of Reconstruction with the rise of Jim Crow, the grandfather clause, a number of different laws that don't use race in them, but target a specific racial group and discriminate against them, prevent them from having access to civil rights. And then the third is arguably the most controversial in other areas where I've had this conversation. There's a crisis in black leadership. I actually take the election of President Obama as the starting point of this crisis because if you study the black American community and you follow black American politics, there's a huge critique of President Obama not doing enough to improve the black community, to resolve issues of racial inequality. I don't follow this. I don't have this critique of Barack Obama. I'm probably one of the most biased supporters of Barack Obama. But I do hear among young generation the distrust of the political system, disaffection with political mobilization. Many aren't aspiring to be Barack Obama. Instead, they're aspiring to be Kanye West or J. Cole or Colin Kaepernick. I know this in part because I teach a black protest and leadership class at Buffalo State College and students are always bringing up. Kanye West and J. Cole and Colin Kaepernick as the leaders, the thought leaders of the 21st century. Power to them. You know, I'm a, I'm a hip-hop junkie. I love hip-hop. And so Kanye West and J. Cole are very important to me in the way that I construct my thinking and my ideology. But I would not call them leaders of the 21st century. And if we are, in fact, using them as leaders, we need to consider what kind of mobilization they're in the advance of. In thinking of Colin Kaepernick, I recognize that he fits into a long tradition of misrepresenting black Americans and black protest in the national media. And so I focus a lot on the narrative of the culture war that results from his protest of the flag. So instead of actually taking what he said his protest was about, police killings and that kind of extrajudicial killings and injustice in society. The establishment media starts to focus largely on the ways that his protest divides people on the issue of patriotism, on the issue of the flag, of disrespect for veterans in the army. I mean, it didn't really matter what he said he was protesting. What mattered was how it was going to be represented in this national media. And so the conversation went far from police killings. In fact, in 2017, the police killings increased. And that never really got into the news. Instead, we we focused largely on what President Trump was saying about Colin Kaepernick and, and also what the NFL should do for others who protested in this incorrect way, right? What, why do you have to protest at the sports game when I'm trying to have a good time? Instead, you should probably boycott that game and not spend money there because they're ruining your recreational activities. And in my piece, I concentrated largely on this distortion of the narrative. But the lesson that I have now, actually, in reflecting on what what was written is that 
what I thought was a major sacrifice for Colin Kaepernick, right? The you know, he's no longer a quarterback in the NFL, actually turned out to be a commercial boon for him. Because I don't know if you're like me, you're probably thinking about buying a San Francisco jersey with Colin Kaepernick's name on it. Or maybe you're looking at Nike newly, you know, you're thinking Nike using Colin Kaepernick to advertise it. I'm not sure if you've seen the commercial. It seems like black American protest is being commercialized at the expense of the issues that everyday black Americans are facing in their communities. So it becomes okay to look at Colin Kaepernick as you would Muhammad Ali, talk about him as you would Carlos Jones and so on. And, and a lot of the pieces said, okay, you know, look at Colin Kaepernick and this tradition of uh, black athletes who protested. But that also served to sell magazines, sell newspapers, and now sell sneakers and jerseys and other commodities. And so I think looking back at what I wrote earlier and then thinking about the direction that it's taken, I, I see that there's a commercialization of black protest that is curious and an outcome I didn't really expect to happen here. Ultimately, I'm not sure where this is going to lead for black leadership. I think this crisis remains. Um, I ask my students all the time, you know, who are the thought leaders, who are the thinkers and doers of the current protest movement? And they have little to say. But Colin Kaepernick still has a lot to teach us, and I'm hoping that there's something else that's gained from this other than the sale of a couple of sneakers. Thank you. Supporting human conditions, not free market propaganda and corrupt politicians. Cause they own by special interest groups that fund their campaign. That's why you hear the same old things they claim, but change never came. It's a dirty game maintained by rain for capital gain. And that does it for another episode of the Project Censored Show. We'd like to thank you all for tuning in. Established in 2010 by myself and Peter Phillips, I am the executive producer of the Project Censored Show, and I am the host of the program. Our co-host is Chase Balmeri. Anthony Fest is our senior producer. Our associate producer is Dennis Murphy. The Project Censored Show airs on roughly 50 stations around the United States, from Maui to New York. To learn more about our work or to find out about any of our previous archive programs, go to Project Censored censored.org. Please follow and like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the official Project Censored show on your phone's podcast app. Also like to make an announcement that our former guest co-hosts of the Project Censored show, Nicholas Baham III and Nolan Higdon, have a new podcast with Media Freedom Foundation and Project Censored. It's called Along the Line. You can learn more about that as well at projectcensored.org, and you can hear more in-depth reporting about the news that doesn't make the news. We'll see you next time. Listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, as well as online at kpfa.org. The time is just about 2 o'clock. Please stay tuned for Terra Verde. With the force of four tons, the war has just begun. More than rust and guns, it's just as fun. You punks can run, but the sword is clutched. You're done, never before explored where cuts can come. Target in sight, aim right, adjust your thumb. You're just as dumb for running your gums. I'll puncture your lungs. Nothing's new under the sun. Hello and
and welcome to Terra Verde, your weekly KPFA environmental